And today, you guys are lucky enough to start section 6.7, the final section of chapter 6. On this section, we're going to be solving radical equations and also radical inequalities. And we are specifically going over questions on the practice test, which you will see on the test of chapter 6. So let's begin these notes by uh, answering the question, how do you solve a radical equation? We should already know how to do this. Um, step one is to isolate the radical on one side of the equal sign. Okay, um, So you want to isolate it. What does that mean if you actually have other items you want to get it all by itself on one side. So for example, let's say we had that as a uh, radical equation. Step one is to isolate the radical. So the radical is obviously on the left side of this equal sign. We need to get it by itself. So what would we get rid of first, the minus three or the two? The minus three, okay, so we'd go plus three and plus three. Uh, that would give us two square root x minus one equals eight. And then to finally get rid of everything, get rid of that multiplication of 2, we would divide by 2, divide by 2, and you would have the square root of x minus 1 equaling 4. Are you with me? Okay, so that is step 1. So I'm going to move this over. I'll put it down here for now. Um, step 2, once you isolate that root, you're going to get rid of the radical by applying its inverse to both sides. Let me make some space here. So here's the work that we've done. Now let's apply uh, step two to get rid of the radical by applying its inverse to both sides. So I need to get rid of this square root by applying the inverse of a square root. What's the inverse of a square root? A square, right? Um, what's the inverse of a third root? A power of three. Inverse of a fourth root, power of four. Okay, so right here we have a square root. To get rid of a square, we do the opposite, the inverse operation, which would be uh, a square, the inverse of a square root. And of course, if you square one side, you must square the other. So that's what step two says, get rid of the radical by applying its inverse to both sides. The inverse of a square root is a square, and we did that to both sides. Now what do we have? We have x minus one equaling 16. Final step would be to get rid of the minus one, plus one, plus one, giving us a final answer of x equaling 17. Okay. Now, it's very, very, very important uh, that we do a third and final step. I mean, we're done, but it's very important. I guess I should have put this on our steps. Step three is to check your answer. Because it is possible to have an extraneous solution that doesn't work. Okay, so here are our three steps. So we isolated the radical on one side. We got rid of the radical by applying its inverse, and we need to check our answer. So take that 17, plug it back into the original. 17 take away 1 is 16. The square root of 16 is what? 4. four. And then 4 times 2 is what? Eight. And 8 take away 3 is what? Five. 5. You see, that's how you check your answer. You just plug it back in. It takes a couple of seconds. Make sure you actually have the right answer. And there will be times where you might do everything right and you get an answer. When you plug it back in, it doesn't work. That's just an extraneous solution. So let's jump into the questions that are actually going to be on the practice test and also on the test, but very similar to it, not exactly like it. So here we go. Um, step one is to isolate the radical on one side. So go ahead and copy it down. Um, if you're watching this at home, hit pause, copy it down, try to do it. I know, everybody's excited, right? Um, so once you get an answer, you don't have to be like, oh, did I get this right? Did I get this right? Plug it in, double check it. Remember, step three is to double check your answer. So whatever answer you get, plug it in, double check. And if it works out, if it does give you negative 11, then you know you absolutely did it right. You got the right answer. Let me actually go through the steps here. Step one, isolate the radical on one side. I need to get rid of that plus four by subtracting four on both sides. I'm going to rewrite this thing. Negative 3 times the square root of x equals negative 15. Uh, I need to get rid of that multiplication of negative 3 right in front by doing the inverse operation division of that same value, negative 3. What you do to one side, do to the other. You will have the square root of x equaling positive 5. How do you get rid of a square? Step 2 says get rid of that radical by doing the inverse of that radical, which in this case is a square. Okay. Uh, if this would have been a third root, then you'd do the third power. If this would have been a fifth root, you'd do the fifth power, and so on and so on, right? Yeah. Okay, 
So I square the left side, I square the right side, I have the answer x equals 25, which I walked around, I saw most of you had that answer. Um, but if you're not sure, you don't have to ask me. You could just plug it in and see if it works. Check it out. Take that 25, put it right there. What is the square to 25? Five. Five. Uh, and you know what? Let, you know, let me actually, let me, I'm going to show my work this time, all right? A lot of times on the explanations, I do it all in my head, and then other students get lost. But yeah, we're plugging in the 25. We're going to plug it right into the square root. So what we have is negative 3 times square root of 25 plus 4 equals negative 11. So of course, doing the math here, the square root of 25 is 5. When you multiply it by negative 3 and then add 4, will it give us negative 11? The answer is yes. Uh, negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. And negative 15 plus 4 really does give us negative 11. So that's what we call double checking. We're absolutely positive that that's the correct answer. Do you get it? Cool. Moving on. All righty, here's the next question. Now, step one, isolate the radical on one side. If you're thinking, wait, there's no radical. Yes, there is. The, the rational exponent, that one-fifth power up here, that's really the fifth root. Now, if you want to write it as the fifth root, you could do that. But you don't have to. You could just leave it like that. This is a radical. You want to isolate it. You don't want this multiplication of negative 6 out in the front. So get rid of that multiplication of negative 6 by dividing by negative 6. So rewriting what we have here, we have the parentheses x minus 4 to the one-fifth power. Again, you could write that as a fifth root if you wanted to equals negative 12 divided by negative 6 is positive 2. Now, how do you do, how do you get rid of the radical here? What, what power am I going to apply? The power of 5. Okay, why is that? Because we know that a power to a power we multiply, and we know that 5 times 1 fifth is 5 fifths, so it would cancel out, right? So you get 1. And of course, what you do to one side, do to the other. Now, if, if you're kind of confused with the rational exponent, you could have changed this to the fifth root, and you should clearly see to get rid of a fifth root, you do the fifth power. Either way, we end up with 2 to the fifth, which is 2 times 2, 4 times 2, 8 times 2, 16 times 2, 32, right? So what we have here is the x minus 4, no more one-fifth power, no more power at all, no more root at all, equals 32. And then we're going to add 4, add 4. Final answer is x equals 36. Now, again, we need to double check this answer, make sure it's not extraneous. Let's plug it in. 36 right in here. I'm going to do this one in my head. 36 take away 4, what is that? 32. Now, on a calculator, if you do 32 to the 1 fifth power, it'll give you the number 2 as an answer. Or you could have recognized that the 1 fifth power is the fifth root, and the fifth root of 32 is 2. So you really have 2 times negative 6. That is negative 12. So we know for a fact that that's a correct answer. We've double checked it. The answer is x equals 36. Let's try another. On this question, some of us might get confused because step one is to isolate the radical on one side. Now, what does isolate mean? That means you don't want a, a, uh, a times 3 out here. You don't want a plus 7 on the outside. And, and there is no such thing. It's already isolated, right? And yes, the instructions say isolate the radical on one side, but we have two radicals. It would be pointless to move this one over here because then you'd have two radicals on one side. Right here, technically, this radical is isolated on one side. This radical is isolated on the other side. So let's just move on to step two because step one is technically done for us. Step two says get rid of the radical by applying its inverse to both sides. So how do I get rid of a square root? Square. And what you do to one side, do to the other. Square. So what we end up with is x plus 5 equals 3x minus 23. I know it's too easy, right? So now all we need to do is solve it. I am going to choose to move my x's to the right. Subtract x, subtract x. I'm going to have a 5 equals 2x minus 23. I'm going to move the minus 23 to the left side by doing a plus 23. Cancels, plus 23. We end up with 28 equals 2x, final step. We divide by 2, giving us the final answer, x equals 14, x equals 14. 
So we did it. We still need to double check our answer, make sure it works. When I plug in 14 right here, 14 plus five is 19. Now the score to 19, just because it's not a nice answer, don't say, oh, wait a minute, it's not working. No, the score to 19 is a, is a decimal answer. It's irrational, but it's still an answer. Um, I'm just gonna leave the score to 19 like that inside the square root. And I'm gonna do this side by plugging in the 14 right there. And three times 14, that is uh, 42. And then 42 take away 23, that's also 19. And as you could see, it is a true statement. The score to 19 will be the score to 19. So you're absolutely positive. You double checked it. This is the correct answer. Yay? Okay. So on this one, I want you guys to, uh, if you're watching from home, pause it, try to do this one, and then hit play. Everybody right now, I'm gonna pause. Please do it. Don't forget to check your answer. Okay, guys. So uh, some of you already finished. Some of you have the answer 36. And uh, I asked you, did you double check it? That doesn't mean look at your, pap your partner's paper and see if you got 36. I mean, because maybe both of you got 36 and that might not be the right answer. As a matter of fact, when we check our answer right here, the 36 is incorrect. It's no solution because when you check it, it doesn't. Exactly. Uh, this is a, a question that's really going to emphasize you doing that step three, which was check your solution, right? You could do all the correct work. Check it out. I'm going to add two, add two. I'm going to end up with negative five squared of x uh, equals 30. And then I'm going to multiply or divide by negative five to get rid of the multiplication of negative five. And that'll give you the square root of x equaling negative six. Of course, you square both sides and you'll get x equals positive 36. Now, again, positive 36 is incorrect because we still need to double check it. When we plug in 36 right here, think about it. The square root of 36 is what? Positive six, right? And you got negative five times positive six, that is negative 30. And then negative 30 take away two is negative 32, not positive 28. So this answer, even though we did all the correct work, this answer is an extraneous solution. Uh, what does that mean? There's just an extra answer that doesn't work. Um, so yeah, in this case, we say no solution. No solution is the correct answer. I hope we understand that. Let's move on. We are finally to the second part of the lesson today. The first part was solving radical equations. The second part is solving radical inequalities. So how do you solve a radical inequality? Well, you solve it the way we've been doing it, right? But we need to remember back in Algebra 1, uh, the difference between solving an equation and solving an inequality is that if you multiply or divide by a negative on your last step, that's when you flip the inequality symbol. You guys remember that? Okay, so uh, we're gonna solve it the way we have been doing it, using those steps like, oh, isolate the radical and then get rid of the square root by applying a square to both sides. You're gonna solve it the way we've been doing it. Just be careful. If you ever multiply or divide by a negative on the last step, you gotta flip that inequality symbol. And then the next step is to set the radicand values to be greater than or equal to zero and solve. I know you guys are thinking radicand, that's a vocab word that represents whatever you see inside the square root, okay? Whatever you see inside the square root, you have to set it to be greater than or equal to zero and solve. Okay, and there's a reason for that because you need your value inside a square root to be zero or greater. If it's less than zero, that would imply that you have a negative inside your square root. And we know that when we do the square root of a negative, you end up with imaginary and you don't want imaginaries. So this is why we have to do step two, set your radicand values to be greater than or equal to zero and solve. And then you're gonna get your answer for the first one you're going to get your answer for the second one, setting the radicand value to be greater than or equal to zero. And then step three, graph your answers on a number line and represent your overlapping piece. Your overlapping piece will be your solution. So here's our first type of question, first type of inequality that we're solving. So let's begin this together. Um, step one is to solve it. Okay, so we're going to solve it the way we normally would. The only thing we have to look out for is multiplying or dividing by a negative on your last step. That's when the inequality changes, all right? So how would we solve this normally? You want to isolate the radical. So what do I do first? Subtract 21. That's right. Subtract 21. And we will have the new radical inequality that reads the square root of 7x uh, minus 14. That's inside the square root. And then we have is less than or equal to 7. Okay. So now what do we do to solve it? 
the, square it, right? To get rid of a square root, we square it, right? It's just like what we've been doing this past 15 minutes, right? So what are we going to have left? We're going to have 7x minus 14 is less than or equal to 49. And then what do I do to solve it? Add 14. Add 14. We're going to end up with 50, uh, 63. So we end up with the 7x is less than or equal to 63. Final step, divide by 7, divide by 7. Answer is x is less than or equal to 9. Ladies and gentlemen, notice that my inequality, less than or equal to, it never changed. Why? Because I never multiplied or divided by a negative. If you ever multiply or divide by a negative, yep, that's going to flip. Okay? So that was step one. Solve it. Get an answer. Boom, we got it. This is our answer right here. Okay. Step two, set the radicand values inside the root to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, this is not just some random mathematician creating rules, right? The fact is, you need this to be either zero or something that's positive. Why? Because we could do the square root of zero. We could do the square root of one, square root of nine. We could even do the square root of seven. It's a decimal answer. But if this were a negative number, we know it's imaginary, right? So this is exactly why we are going to go inside the root and set that radicand value, that 7x minus 14, we are going to set it greater than or equal to zero. So we're going to set it to be greater than or equal to zero. Again, we need this to be zero or greater than zero, right? Because if it were less than zero, it's negative, and that would give us an imaginary answer. That messes everything up. So this is why we take that radicand value and set it greater than or equal to zero. So now let's solve. So we're going to subtract, or we're going to add 14 to get rid of that minus 14. Add 14. We're going to end up with 7x is greater than or equal to 14. Final step, we are going to divide by 7, divide by 7. And we will get x is greater than or equal to 2. And this is our answer for that. That's barely step 2. Moving on to step 3, what does it say? Graph all answers on a number line and represent the overlapping piece. So we're going to go to a number line. And uh, obviously, the number 2 is going to be on the left side. The number 9 is greater than. It's going to be on the right side. And then we need to graph each of these guys, all right? So when I say x is less than or equal to 9, it's going to be a solid dot at 9. Less than is to the left. When I look at x is greater than or equal to 2, greater than on the 2, greater than to the right. So the area, the overlap, is between the 2 and the 9. So x could be anywhere between 2 and 9, um, and it can even be 2, and it can even be 9. Anyway, uh, how do we represent this as, an, uh, as a compound inequality? Because it's between 2 and 9. It's super easy. Put the x in the middle. Put your less than symbols like this. Because if it's in a number line, then your lower numbers are on the left, your greater numbers are on the right. So these are always going to be opening up to the right if it's on a number line. Now, the last thing to do is recognize that your original inequality had a or equal to. And also, when you set your radicand, you set it greater than or equal to zero. So we need or equal to's on both of those. So put an or equal to right there and right there. And that is your answer, which is this first one right here. I hope we get that. Now, sometimes when you graph, they're not always going to overlap right here in between each other. Sometimes they'll both go this way, which means your answer will be the single inequality x is greater than 9, if it's going that way, greater than or equal to 9. Or they might be going to the left, which means x is less than or equal to 2. We'll see some of those examples shortly. OK, so. So step one is to solve it, which means I am going to get rid of this 4 by subtracting 4. And I still have the negative, negative square root of x plus 3. And then I have the less than or equal to 1. Okay. Just like we did before, you isolate it. Now, this is still not isolated. I still need to get rid of the negative 1 in front of this square root. That's like saying... I have a negative 1 times the square root, right? So I need to divide by negative 1, divide by negative 1. 
Now we are dividing by a negative. It is an inequality, which means what? Change the sign, right? Switch the sign. So what do I have left? Now that it's isolated, I have the square root of x plus 3, but the, the uh, less than or equal to is now going to switch to greater than or equal to, and 1 divided by negative 1 is negative 1. Okay, so we're still in the process of solving it, right? I want to get rid of the square root next. So I'm going to square the left side, square the right side, and now I have x plus 3 is greater than or equal to positive 1. After that, I want to get rid of the plus 3 by subtracting 3. What I do to one side, I do to the other. Subtract 3. I will have x is greater than or equal to negative 2. Are you with me? So that's barely step 1, solving it and getting an answer. We just did that. We got an answer. Let's move on to step 2. Set the radicand value inside of the root to be greater than or equal to 0. Once again, the inside value of the root is the binomial x plus 3. And we need that inside value of x plus 3. We need it to be either equal to 0 or greater than 0. We need it to be either equal to 0 or greater than 0. Because if it were less than 0, it would be negative, which causes an imaginary value, which means we won't get real answers. So uh, once again, the radicand is the value inside the root. So you don't even write the square root. You just write whatever's inside. You don't even write the root. You don't write anything on the outside. It's simply what you see inside the root. Now, the radicand might just be x if it didn't have the plus 3. It might be a 2x plus 3. It might just be a x minus 3. I don't know. Whatever's in here, that's all you write and set it to be greater than or equal to 0. Now, let's solve this thing. We're going to subtract 3, subtract 3. We will end up with x is greater than or equal to negative 3. So we have our two answers here. We have this guy, x is greater than or equal to negative 2. And we have uh, x is greater than or equal to negative 3. We now move on to our third step, which is graph all your answers on a number line and represent the overlapping piece. So on a number line, I know that negative 3 should be further left, and negative 2 should be further right. Why? Because it's closer to the positive numbers. It's closer. It's on the right side. So let's graph x is greater than or equal to negative 2, right? Graphing this guy, x is greater than or equal to negative 2. That's a solid dot at negative 2 greater than to the right. x is greater than or equal to negative 3. Here's negative 3 greater than to the right also. Where's the overlapping piece? It's from here this way. That's the overlapping piece, right? So I am not going to select this compound inequality answer. Even though it had a negative 3 and a negative 2 in it, I'm not going to select that one. That one's wrong, OK? Where does it overlap? It only overlaps starting at negative 2 to the right. That means x is greater than or equal to negative 2. Check it out. Boom. That's the one that's correct. Yay? Let's try another <laughs> explanation of this last question that we're doing here. Um, we want to solve it. So I need to recognize that this really is the multiplication. If I read this, it reads negative 3 times the square root of x plus 7. So if I want to get rid of the multiplication of negative 3, I need to divide by negative 3. That's a couple of mistakes I saw as I walked around the class. We do to one side, do to the other side, divide by negative 3. Now we are dividing by negative 3 on an inequality. So on the left side, yes, I have the x plus 7. Um, on the right side, since I'm dividing by a negative, I must flip this inequality symbol and make it a less than or equal to. Okay? And of course, a negative 12 divided by a negative 3 is a positive 4. Okay? So now I need to get rid of this square root. I want to get rid of the square root by doing the inverse of a square root, which is a square. What you do to one side, do to the other side. I will end up with the x plus 7 is less than or equal to 16. Now we are going to get rid of that plus 7 by subtracting 7, the inverse of adding 7 and subtracting 7. What you do to one side, do to the other. x not equals x is less than or equal to, uh, what is that, 9. Okay. So this is one answer right here that we're going to graph on a number line in a little bit. But before we graph it, we need to do step 2. Set the radicands, the values inside the square root, to be greater than or equal to 0. So this x plus 7, I need to set it to be greater than or equal to 0. Again, this x plus 7, nothing else. You don't write the square root. You don't write the negative 3 in the front. You just write x plus 7. It has to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. And then you solve that one. Subtract 7, subtract 7. 
x is greater than or equal to negative 7. And that's all you could do. That's your answer there. Let's go to step three, go to a number line. So uh, negative 7 for sure is on the left side where the negative numbers are at. And uh, 9 is over here in the positives, right? So we have negative 7 and 9. Let's graph each of these. The first one says x is less than or equal to 9, less than or equal to, solve dot at 9, going to the left. Less than is to the left. The other one, x is greater than or equal to negative 7, greater than is to the right. Um, and the overlap is between negative 7 and 9. So the easiest way to do that, especially if you already graphed it on a number line, is to put x in the middle, put less than symbols, and then ask yourself, do we have less than or equal to? We have an or equal to, greater than or equal to. Either way, it's going to be or equal to um, on, on this one and or equal to when we set the radicand to be greater than or equal to uh, zero, right? So they're both or equal to. So put the or, those or equal to's right there, and there's your compound inequality answer, which is this guy right here. Negative 7 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 9. I hope this helps. This is the final lesson of chapter 6. And because this specific section hasn't been popping out on the quizzes, expect to see more of these than all the other sections, OK? Which is good news, because I think it's pretty straightforward, pretty easy.